Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. All right, welcome to Revolution, everyone. Um, another day in very cold paradise. Ac- actually, it's not that cold out. It's, you're wearing shorts? Caleb has cutoffs on. That's nice, Caleb. Cutoffs and a hot hat and a beanie. Keeping it real. Um, oh, so the kid's mom is out of town, so I've got the kids again this week, so we're going crazy. Um, getting ready to drive up to Missouri, Missouri tomorrow. Maybe I'll do a live video from Missouri, post some pictures with my dad so people can tell me to straighten him out again, and then I can laugh. <laughs> Um, I was trying to think of any good stories to tell, but I don't have many. Oh, I do have one. So on my, the day before my birthday, I, um, got early birthday present, got tattooed, got this sucker, this, that's not a T, that's an F, it's just a fancy F, and then this, bam, life ends, so a little dark, but true, um, to remind me to live a life worth living. Um, so yeah, and I, I got all bandaged up and they j- bandaged my fingers up with blue bandages and then put a purple bandage on my hand and I had to go to the kid's Christmas party and be around all the other kid's parents with my hands all wrapped up in very colorful bandages. And once again, Jay was a weirdo. Always love it. Find a way to make everybody uncomfortable. Um... <laughs> trying to figure out what somebody thought I got in a skateboarding accident. I was like, no, just tattoos. Um, so today I want to talk about, I, I, I originally was working on this and I called it disillusioned or illusioned and kind of like, do we want to be illusioned? You know, because when you say people are disillusioned, I one time said, you know, you know, revolution is a church for the disillusioned. You know, we reach out to people who are disillusioned, and this guy goes, well, who are you to say that I'm disillusioned? And I was like, well, then are you illusioned? Are you under an illusion? (laughs) And he's like, how dare you say that about me? I was like, wait, you just told me I couldn't say you were disillusioned, and now you're, you know, we got to pick one. Um, And you can probably hear my son in the background because he's got headphones on, and he doesn't realize that he's talking very loud because he has headphones on. Um, cause he said he gets bored when he got church, when he can't watch something. So Caleb's letting him watch a video. I know one day, maybe he'll find church exciting. Um, so me and Caleb have talked about moving this, this little, this little, this video over to, um, Facebook. So we might do live Facebook video, maybe not next week, but maybe starting in the new year. With the with 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 my Galatians, we do Galatians the beginning of every every uh, every year. We go through Galatians, and I'm pretty stoked about it. I love that. Um, so basically, today what I wanted to talk about is the power of brokenness. Um, so many of us have who've grown up in the church or want a part of the church uh, have been part of the church have been hurt by the church, um, by religion, and religious people, really. And that's what I want to look at a little bit is, is the idea of, of, you know, being disillusioned with religion. Um, but I guess one of my questions is, one, are we disillusioned with people in religion and not religion itself, or not faith, it's, if not the, the, the actual faith, but the religion and the people in it, um, and by ignorant people. And I don't mean ignorant in a bad way. I just mean in people who haven't studied the Bible for themselves and just took an American tradition of what the Bible is and just took a toxic religion and continued to preach it and live it and crush us with impossible standards. You know, is that... that what a lot of us have been hurt by and disillusioned by. 
Um, I can definitely get the idea that, you know, reading the Bible isn't easy, and there's some things in there that are hard to see. Um, but have we been disillusioned by people? Um, and bad theology. You know, a lot of times I, I've, I've had, I remember a few years back I was in Seattle, and I had a guy pull me aside. I was at this party, and this happens every now and then because of my work. Um, pulls me aside and goes, I used to believe everything you believed, and I don't anymore, and I feel happier and more free than I've ever been. And I said, okay. I said, well, what do you believe? And then he started to tell me about how he was going to um, this church called Mars Hill <laughs> with, um, what was that pastor's name? It's been so long. I, no, it wasn't, not, that, not Rob Bell's Mars Hill, um, the other Mars Hill. Um, it would be... What was his name? Mark Driscoll. So I was like, well, I'm like, I don't believe anything he believes. I said, I don't believe the majority of what his faith is. So I don't, and I'm like, I don't believe in what you believe either. And maybe that's why I'm happier. I don't know. Um, but I was looking at Matthew 23, 4. Um, in Matthew 23, 4, Jesus is talking, and he's talking about the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes. And I'll, start with, uh, I'll start with one. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do. So don't act like they do. For they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on your shoulders of others. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So, I mean, it goes on to say, it goes, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their, you know, their prayers broad and, and, and they're pious. And I'm just, they, their, their fringes are long, their prayer fringes. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues, and to be greeted with respect in the marketplace, and have people call them rabbi, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you're all students. And call no one your father on earth, you have one father and one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for blah, 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 let's pass that. The greatest among you will be servants. All who exalt, exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, the idea is here, is he's saying, you know, religious people have always been a problem. Religious leaders have always been a problem. Human nature has always allowed people to get into positions where they want to be praised, where they want to be looked at, where they want to be, you know, important. Um, Jesus is dealing with religious leaders who are, are, are basically crushing people with impossible standards. And for me growing up, that was the hardest part of growing up in church, is that I felt like I was constantly being crushed with impossible standards. Like I couldn't live up to anybody's expectations. And imagine if you were LGBTQ, IA. <laughs> I'm starting to get the, the to do new letters in. Um, of course you would feel rejected. I felt like I could never be good enough. I could never add up. I saw the way that people treated my parents as a kid. You know, I, I, when they made a, you know, they failed and they made a mistake and then the whole world saw this mistake. And I remember sitting in churches and hearing people preach sermons against my parents, you know. So it was this constant feeling of like, I can never add up, I can never be good enough, I can never do this. And so I was disillusioned. And I think so many of us are. Now, it wasn't until my own, my own research, my own looking into the Bible that I understood what grace was. And I remember even calling my dad late at night and being like, Dad, you know, what the hell? You know, why didn't we talk about this? Why didn't we talk about grace? You know, this is really good news. There's good news in the Bible, you know. And, and, and why isn't that there? And he said, you know, well... Sometimes it feels too good to be true. So when tradition becomes so toxic 
that it blocks out the basic messages of the, 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 the solid foundational messages of the Christian faith, we've got a problem. And if you look at people like Luther, who, uh, the, 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 you know, Luther was, was completely disillusioned with the Catholic Church and with the indulgences and all this stuff. And he goes, you know, something's wrong. And he hated himself and to the pact where he would beat himself, you know, and say, oh, what a horrible person I am. I, I'm, I'm so bad. I'm so horrible. And this, all this self-hate. And then, you know, one day he read Paul's writings and got grace. And what did he do? He reformed the church. Now, it wasn't a perfect reformation, and Luther was not a perfect human being. And guess what? There are no perfect human beings. And if you want someone to not let you down, then don't put faith in them or expect them to be perfect, and that might be a better way because sometimes we put impossible expectations on each other. But the problem is, is a lot of times when we're leaders or pastors and things like this, and especially when we're kids, we look at these people and we allow them to be on a pedestal, and unfortunately, they allow themselves to be on the pedestal. And that's what Jesus is saying about the Pharisees is he's saying, these guys are letting themselves be on pedestals, but they're not practicing what they teach. You know, they love to be seen and respected. And when you're only seen a couple hours a week, it's easy to hold up a facade. It's easy to be something that you're not. It's easy to, to put out this, this um, false narrative of who you are and cry, cry, raise these expectations of other people to think, well, I have to be like that. Well, not even the people that you're looking at are like that, you know? So it's toxic religion. Um, another thing that Jesus says about these religious leaders is he goes, but woe to you scribes and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven, and for you do not go in yourself. And when others are going in, you stop them. Woe to you, scribes and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you cross sea and land to make a single convert, and you make the new convert twice as much a child of hell as yourself. You know, how many times have we seen this where people have had these huge conversion experiences, and then they become hateful and legalistic and judgmental. But they're doing that because that's what they've been taught. That's what they see. You know, they're not usually spending a lot of time going through the scriptures. They're going through and trusting people to interpret the scriptures for them. You know, and all, often in the church, the problem is, is we expect the pastors and the leaders to, one, know what they're talking about, and two, to believe on our behalf. Um, it's just a human nature thing to do that, but the problem is it just ends in destruction. And so sometimes this disillusionment that we have and this hurt that we have, we have to look back and go, what was my responsibility? We can't just scapegoat the bad leaders. We also have to look at ourselves and go, why did I put faith in this person? You know, why did I believe this? Um, and, 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 and look at our own self. Um, one of the things I saw when a lot of people, when um, the guy who wrote I Kiss Dating Goodbye came, what? Joshua Harris came out and denounced his book. A lot of people were very angry at him for what they did. But at the same time, you know, somebody had to go out and purchase that book, and then you had to open the book and take time to read that book and believe that book. Now, I was lucky enough to have a bit of a foundation scripture and enough life behind me that when that book came out, I was like, this is garbage. You know, I didn't buy into it. You know, so part of the anger is, is people get angry going, I'm angry at you because I believed you and I read your book and I bought it and I bought into it. So in some ways, we're still angry at ourselves for buying in to the lie, buying into that. So, so that's where I say is, is, is looking and owning your side of the road. Now, should have you written that book? No, I don't think so, you know. Should we be, you know, writing, reading people to tell us not to date it when, who are 21 years old? Probably not. Um, 
but there's also enough evidence that at, even at that time to show that 50% of people in the, in the church were divorced, 50% in America were divorced. I think the numbers are higher now. But the fact is, is, you know, sometimes we have to go, why did I buy into that? So a lot of this time when we get disillusioned or we're no longer illusioned with these people who are c turning us into sons of hell or putting impossible standards and crushing us, is our eyes are being opened and we're growing. You know, and so someone said some of us were never presented with anything different. Well, you were eventually, you know, and, and now you're not there anymore. The fact is we all have to grow, you know. Um, a lot of us grow up in different homes, in different backgrounds, believing different things, told things are different things that are truth. I mean, even like if you just look at Santa Claus or things like that, you know what I mean? I don't want to get too much. My kids are here. But <laughs> we're told that certain things are true, and then we grow, and then we realize they're not. Um, so it's part of our journey in our growth system, and it's just so easy to have our journey, <sighs> to look at our journey and want to make bad guys out of our journey, but often it's the story we find ourselves in, and it's just part of our growth. And one of the things that I think is great is, is like, if, I would, if you think of someone like Luther, who reformed the church, who, who, who left the Catholic church, um, who told us, you know, talked a lot about grace and was changed by that, you know, if you said, do you want to go back? They'd go, of course not. Do you want to go through that pain again? Of course not. But unfortunately, for a lot of us, for me, it takes a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, uh, sometimes to change. Because I get comfortable in what I've always known. I get comfortable in the relationships I've always been in. You know? And then there comes a time of disillusionment and a time of questioning and a time of making hard decisions. But it's growth. And that's what I, I want to challenge us to do is maybe even get to the point where we're able to... And this is hard. I'm not saying I've done it. I've done it with some people. But we're grateful to our enemies for making us who we are. I'm grateful for Jerry Falwell because I'm grateful that I'm not online being like his son. You know, I'm grateful that maybe there were legalistic people in my life so I didn't treat other people legalistic. When my dad went to prison, that changed my life. When my parents lost everything, that changed my life. I wouldn't want that kind of pain anymore. I'm still in therapy because of that pain, because of, the, because of such a, a horrible thing to happen to someone who is a kid and doesn't have any responsibility with it. But, but it allowed me to become something else. It allowed me that at my 21, I wasn't reading, writing sermons about kissing, dating, goodbye, or telling everybody how they had to be good enough or this or that. I was begging everybody to understand grace and begging the church to change. That's what I went through. So I'm grateful for my enemies. Why? Because I'm not them. I didn't become them. I don't live in the illusion anymore. The curtain has been taken back and I've seen it. And I have a lot of questions. And I'm not afraid of questions anymore. I'm not afraid of living in doubt. I'm not afraid of that. But it's all that's come because I've seen what the other side is for what it is. And that is really, really tough. You know, I'm a different... I, I posted a, a quote today on Instagram saying, I'm a different person than I was in January 2019 than I am in, 2009, in December 2019. And I see how much my life has changed over the year and how much my relationship with people have changed and how much my own work has changed. Um, and it all came from the hardest time of my life. Um, I just think it's so easy for us to scapegoat others for our hurts and our pains and not take the responsibility for what we bought into or how we coped with it. Now, what I want to say is, is it's okay that you coped the way you coped. We all do what we can to cope and how to live. It's a coping mechanism. I mean, that's the whole idea of why it's called coping. It's a survival mechanism. Um, but then we realize that that's not living. 
living in coping mechanisms isn't really life. And hopefully we can bounce out of that, come out of that, stronger people, wiser people, and more loving people. And you know what? We also might be more cautious because we don't want to get hurt again. And we might actually tell other people to be more cautious because we don't want to see them hurt again. And I say love cautiously. You know, everybody, love radically, love crazy. You can love people, but you have to always be cautious because people are hurt. People are hard. You know, why is 1 Corinthians 13 so insane? It's because it's, you know, asking you to do something that's nearly impossible. You know, why does the Bible say take up your cross? You know, because it's, it's, it's saying when you love people, sometimes it'll get you crucified. When you ex- include people, sometimes, I mean, I, I think P- Jesus was killed because he was inclusive, not because he was exclusive. You know? And um, he loved the wrong people. Obviously, there aren't lo- wrong people to love, but he loved people and he got him, he got him killed. What I hope is that our disillusionment causes us to become, want to become more educated, to want to study more. And for some of us, we just leave it. We leave the faith completely. But for me, I studied it more, and I decided to stick around. Now, if you left, that's fine. <laughs> if you stuck around, that's fine. You know. But the fact is, is if something doesn't add up, if we're being hurt in the name of someone who's like, love God with all your heart and your enemies is yourself. And Jesus is, you know, grace and hope. And you hear all these good things and then you see the exact opposite. It might be time to look into it. It might be time to read some boring books. Um, but also, you know, I don't know. I just want to be able to be in a reality where I'm grateful for the fact that I know what made me. And I've been made from pain. I've been made from hurt. Um, yesterday I had a panic attack for about five minutes and the panic attack only lasted you know five minutes and usually my panic attacks usually 20-30 minutes and it's because I've taken time to learn about the panic attacks to give in to the panic attack to let it just be and accept it it's not something that I'm accepting that I like or that I enjoy. Matter of fact, it's horrible and it's awful, especially when you have kids running around. It, 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 it doesn't feel good. But I've allowed myself to accept it. And with that acceptance, it moves through quicker. And I was so surprised. Like, I didn't have to take a, a, a pill, you know, to do something. I was just able to sit with it and let it go. And I've been doing that with pain, you know. And sometimes I cry. You know, sometimes I get in my shower and I just cry. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm not, life's not perfect. Life is really tough. When I, when I preach this type of sermon, um, I'm not trying to get you to believe more or have more faith or do any of this. When I wanna, what I really want you to do is live a life well and live a better life. You know, um, But that's a life that doesn't buy into the happiness trap. You know, that doesn't buy into the fact that we're always going to be happy. You know, it's like, I'm going to trade Christianity for this thing, and then I'll be happy. You know what I mean? It's like, there's no secret to happiness. There's no thing that's going to complete us in this life. You know, we kind of try to search it, and we try to fill the void, and then we get disappointed because we aren't filled, and our expectations are so high that we lose our, 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 we end up just being disillusioned again. Because we have such high expectations. You know, lower the bar. Lower your expectations of people and yourself. You know, realize that life is tough. Life is suffering. Um, There are joyful moments. But I mean, imagine people in the majority of this world see so much suffering, see so much pain, that we can't even grasp it. You know? I mean, I live in a crappy apartment, but it's got really nice running water. It's got a nice refrigerator in it. You know, it's heated. My kids are warm at night to the point where they're like, I don't want blankets or my (laughs) pajamas. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, that's my biggest problem is like, no, keep your pajamas on. (laughs) You know, that's, there's people who would die and kill for that. And I've got that. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm not saying we need to compare pain because pain is pain. Um, And we all have pain and we're all suffering. And I'm sorry that you're suffering. I'm sorry that times are hard. 
but what I want to do is not just accept that I'm accepted, but accept that life is tough. To accept that life is part of life is suffering. And, you know, when Paul says, you know, I'm a Christian and I'm a Christ, follow her Christ and I've died with Christ, he's saying I've suffered with Christ. I've lost with Christ. Christ on the cross is God, God, why have you forsaken me? You know, this wasn't a theological statement as much as it's just a bleeding out of his heart. God, I've been forsaken by you. I don't feel God anymore. I don't feel my friends anymore. I don't feel the people who love me anymore. Everything is gone. I have been abandoned and I'm exposed and dying a horrible, miserable death. You know, and I think we it's a good example of just what life brings. So I don't want to say feel bad for feeling bad. No, feel bad, get through it, mourn, go through it. Deal with it as much as you can. Get a therapist if you can. I mean, I'm all for that. But I just want us to realize is that, you know, we either live life, we either live or we don't. You know, I made a decision about a year ago to not do it anymore. And I failed at that. And I'm grateful that I failed at that. Um, And so I just, you know, once I realized I failed at that, I had to make the decision in my own life to either, you know, go on suffering or try that again. And I was tempted to do it again. That time, the second time I would have done it. And I'm just being vague because my children are here. Um, but I've decided to live life on life's terms. And I learned that in the 12-step program. You know, and they used to always say that expectations would steal your serenity. And so I learned to not live in, in that either. So, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tough, life is tough. Life is suffering. Um, sometimes I do wish I could close the curtain again and be a little illusioned because sometimes I found a lot of peace in that illusion and certainty. But I'm not anymore. Certainty's gone. I've lost my certainty. You know? When I pray out, I don't know if there's anything on the other side of those prayers. And I feel alone. But I'm also grateful for the friends that I have in my life. Um, I'm grateful for the people that I have that push back in my life. You know, I think if I was, my pain and my own suffering have caused me to love people more and be more patient with people and not want to return the favor of causing other people to suffer and cause them to do that. Honestly, I'd be, I, if I was clear, I mean, if I'm honest with myself, I could be a complete progressive preacher and probably be more successful. And I could get on and I could talk about Trump and his followers and all that kind of shit all day long and just say, this group's wrong and they're not real Christians and they're not all that. But you know what? I don't believe that. It's true. And I can't scapegoat people anymore. I've watched my parents be scapegoat my whole life. I'm not going to scapegoat people anymore. Do I think Trump's an asshole? Yes. You know? But I'm not going to say my group is right and your group is wrong because it doesn't make any sense. That doesn't change anything. You know? Christianity Today, wrote, uh, a guy wrote an article saying Trump should leave office, and I watched a lot of my progressive friends be like, well, that wasn't brave because he's leaving, and it's too late. You know, and I'm like, we want people to change and become more like us, <laughs> and then they do, and then we tell them, sorry, that wasn't fast enough. Sorry, that wasn't brave enough. Sorry, you know, it's too late. I mean, what? how is that... A movement. I, I tweeted this yesterday. I'm like, it sounds like a bad relationship. It sounds like a bad breakup. You know, someone comes to you a year later and is like, I've changed. I'm a different person. And you're like, oh, it's kind of too late. I get that. <laughs> you know, but when you have a movement and you're trying to change people's hearts and change people's minds and change people's lives, you know, or, you know, and someone comes and says, I agree with your movement now. You don't go like, well, you were an asshole. I mean, imagine if, if Jesus would have done that or the Christians would have done that to Paul the Apostle. Well, you killed a bunch of Christians, so it's a little too late, and we don't want your kind around here. 
So we have no Paul Paulinian books, which a lot of people I pray about we'd be really happy with. But for me, I would never have discovered grace if it wasn't for Paul. That's why I'm Paulinian. Um, I'd had a, I needed Paul to explain Jesus to me. So, um, and Luther wouldn't have reformed the church because you know I think it was Galatians two that he read that changed his heart. So. That's what happens when we, we say it's too late for you. And that Josh Harris, a lot of people came out and was like, it's too late. I'm like, really? It's too late? You know, that's what I love about grace, and that's why I con- consider grace like anarchy, is because grace is it's never too late for grace. You know? You think about when Darth Vader <laughs> repents <laughs> to his son and becomes good, and then he becomes a force ghost. I mean, how unfair is that? He killed little baby Jedis. <laughs> and then if you read the extra canical stuff, <laughs> he, did a, he killed a lot of people. <clears throat> he was a bad man. It was basically like Hitler's last minute decided, I'm sorry, son, I've wronged you. You know, okay, it's cool. And that, you know, so if we can buy it in Star Wars, can we maybe try to buy it in our own, our own faith and ideas? <laughs> you know, so grace to me is, is revolutionary. Um, and I'm not going to let the powers that be, not my fellow lefties and not the other righties, tell me how to love and tell me how to show grace and tell me who's in or who's out just not going to do it anymore. I want everybody to be in. I want everybody to have a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance. There's five. You know? Um, all right. So I, so I, I struggle with regret, too, greatly. And I wish I could go back in time and change some of my decisions and some of the choices I made. Um, but, you know, I also realize if I look back on that, the way I had to, would have changed some of the things that I regret, I would not be the person I am today. Or I might still be in the toxic relationship because I needed that love and that acceptance so much. You know? It's tough, because I often feel called back to the people that I feel like love me. I mean, I remember, I, I remember at PTL having like one of the bodyguards that I really loved and cared about came out and said all this horrible stuff about my parents. And um, everyone was like, he wasn't your friend, so don't worry about it. You didn't lose a friend. I mean, yeah, I did lose a friend. I did lose somebody I loved very much. You know what? And they actually came back around and apologized eventually. And my heart was so open with joy that they asked for forgiveness and that they were sorry because I always loved them so much and wanted to be in their lives. I think sometimes our loved ones and our friends betray us because they're just victims of misinformation or they get caught up in the world. And when you think you're working for God or doing God's work and you're doing that to the best of your possible understanding and you're illusioned <laughs> and you're told something that is God and is not God and so you follow it, you know, I think their hearts might be in the right place even though they're hurting us and causing us pain. You know, the hope is, is that we may be able to go back and set them free or that someone else will set them free, you know? That's why I've sent my dad a dozen books. I've sent him every Brendan Manning book ever made, you know? I've even sent him Philip Yancey books thinking like, well, this is a little lighter. Maybe he'll get this one. Um, So I hope for reconciliation. But honestly, like being divorced, I've realized reconciliation is very, very hard in that type of loving relationship, but I've also seen it in other relationships. Like, I, I've just connected with a few people from Revolution that I've had falling outs with. And now we're reconnecting and getting back and trying to recon- reconcile our relationships. But I'm able to realize that both of, the, both of us would not be the same people we were and have been on the same journey had we not had the conflict that was in our lives. I would disagree a lot with my talk if I thought this was the only answer, so I'm not telling you this is the only answer. (laughs) This is just a suggestion learned from my own road and my own walk. 
Um, man, I've said things to people and hurt them. I've been the bad guy in the story. I've caused people to go on journeys and probably reject God myself, you know? And I hate that. And I hope those people will forgive me. Um, not because they have to reject God, but just because I hurt them. But anyway, the, the idea of Matthew is, is, is Jesus saying toxic, toxic religious people have been an issue since the beginning of time. And f- unfortunately, they are, you know, they're usually in a place of authority. Um, and they're the loudest, often the loudest, because they want to be seen and they like the way it feels and they feel good about it. You know what? And really, those people are just trying to fill some void in them. You know? Probably their own lack of, their own lack of faith, their unowned happiness. So they're projecting something you know, to try to project an image of happiness, of completeness that's not there, you know. I mean, why do you think so many of these preachers drive really nice cars, really nice watches, really nice clothes, really nice this stuff? You know, why was my mom a shopaholic at the top of her game? You know what I mean? (laughs) Why did she wear makeup? Because she thought she wasn't attractive, you know, to the point where people made fun of her saying she wasn't attractive wearing the makeup, but for her the makeup completed something for her because it became her armor. So, covering up, filling a void, putting on a mask, pretending something they're not. These were our leaders, and these are often our leaders. I mean, I think we might want to be grateful that... Here's something to be grateful about Trump. He's a little more transparent than most people. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, he says a lot of dumb things. <laughs> and most people, hopefully, a lot of us can see it, but some of us are so masked and so bought in that we, you know, a lot of people are just in like, they can't even, they refuse to see it. So you see denial in action. You see this denial in action. You see people trying to fill a void that they'll accept anything. I mean, Christians right now seem so desperate that they'll accept anything. You know, um, but yeah, if, if my parents had become, had, had reached some sort of enlightenment period of when they were in the top of their game, they wouldn't have needed the cars and the nice houses and all that stuff. They, their work would have fulfilled their lives, you know? And I've learned that. And my work really does fulfill my life in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, there's still things I try to fill the void with, but, but a lot of ways I, I don't. You know, I barely raise money. We need more money, actually. I want to hire Caleb. I'd like to have a regular paycheck. Um, But um, maybe that's the problem with sometimes finding peace in your message. I don't know. I'm getting off the, 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 the rails here a little bit. Let's try to reel it back in. This is why grace matters. Because it's just one of the things that we desperately need. You know? Um... My hope is for most people who've been hurt by the church and want to decide to stay is that they become a beacon of hope and that they're able to reconcile old relationships and be the change. We've got to pause due to poor connection. But to be the change that they wanted to see. I'm a big believer in uh, revolutions. And starting revolutions and uh, reformation. But reformation and revolutions and things like that usually come out of great pain. Great leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., great pain. You know, great hurt, great disillusionment, great pain causes often us to have the the leaders that we want to be and want to see. And sometimes those leaders that seem that aren't so great haven't faced their pain or dealt with their pain. And they're still living in an illusion and selling the illusion as fact. So in some ways, we've been given a gift to not be in the illusion anymore. 
we've been given the gift to be disillusioned, to be hurt, to be scarred, and to be broken. Because the fact is, is I believe that when we talk about what the Bible talks about sin, what it's really talking about is brokenness. And that what it's saying is, is we confess that we are broken. Because when we don't believe we're broken or don't think we're broken, we become like religious leaders, like Pharisees and like Sadducees and like these people who raise impossible standards because we don't realize ourselves are broken. You know, or we're so broken inside that we don't want anybody to see it. So we wear the extra long robes and pray out loud and drive the nice cars to say, oh, look what Jesus has done for me. Everything's fine, you know. But people, successful people still kill themselves. So this is the hard, painful truth and my thoughts today. Um, so you choose to do with what you will with that. Um, I'm going to give one more example of a movement that changed my life, and then we'll, we'll, we'll end this thing. Um, a movement that went and stopped and didn't stop in the most pretty way, probably, but was the emergent church that I was a part of, that Pete Rollins came out of. <laughs> he probably doesn't want to admit that, that, um, <laughs> that uh, sarcastic Luther came out of. Um, a lot of really cool speakers came out of, um, came out because they were all, we were all disillusioned with the way the church was reacting. We were disillusioned with the way the church was. We didn't want the church to be the same way. So a bunch of us got together and started talking about how disillusioned Nadia Boltz Weber was a big part of it. You know, and everybody loves her now, but she was a big part of the movement. And had the movement succeeded, I think she'd probably be the face of the movement. Um, Rachel Held Evans um, was a big part of the movement. Um, we were all disillusioned with the way church was going. And we were all hurt from these huge churches that we had been part of. And so we decided that we wanted to do a different message. And at first, the church accepted us because they thought it was just a bunch of people sitting on couches with, you know, fog machines or something and candles. But it, when they realized there was more depth to it, they rejected it. And then we tried to do our own thing. And then what happened was is that there were people who became part of the emergent church who were dissatisfied with the emergent church because we didn't go far enough. And we weren't inclusive enough or we weren't this enough. And we weren't ever really a real or actual organization. It was just kind of a bunch of people kind of being like, what are we talking about? Is, you know, is, is there any truth? Is there any, you know, and it happened and it, disappeared, but a lot of us are better because of it. Um, and I'm grateful for it. But that was a movement that, that came out of disillusionment and hurt and pain. Every person I sat down with and met with was disillusioned and hurt by the church. And they wanted to make the church a better place. They wanted to see a safer place. And uh, I think we can do that with pain. There's a person on here right now who I know doesn't believe in God anymore and is done with all that stuff. <laughs> and whether they want to admit it or not, <laughs> are still trying to make the church a better place. Actions speak louder than words. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> Put your hand against the screen. Um, <laughs> so you, don't, you, don't, you could throw out the baby in the bathwater and still come back and make a change, a radical change. Um, people who don't believe in God have the huge experience, have huge impact on my life. Maybe a bigger impact on my life than my fellow believers, if you will. Um, so, today's sermon, today's talk is, can we be grateful for the pain that we've endured Maybe just a little bit. I have a little small place in my life where I can just be a little bit grateful for the pain that I've been through, um, some personal pain that I've been through. Um, but it's funny because I, I look at it and I go, I have like these moments of clarity where I'm like, oh, I'm so glad that I'm at where I'm at and I feel good and I want to do better and do all this. 
but I know in an hour I'm going to feel regret and hopelessness and all that. How to, my mind feels like it is, is full of contradictions. And you know what? And I know life is contradictory, full of contradictions. And I know that I can't change those contradictions even I know they exist. And it's still, knowing all that doesn't change the fact that contradictions make me crazy. That I'm two different people. It's really tough. But you know what? We can get through this together. I'm going to keep trying if you keep trying. And you know what? Some of you here um, on Instagram have sent me DMs and messages um, that have kept me going. And I get these little things every now and then where people really encourage me. And it really means the world to me to know that my work has affected people positively. It really does. Um, so what I'm saying is don't just do that to me. Look at your brothers and sisters and what they're saying on this, this talk right here. And, you know, talk to each other, you know. Follow each other on Instagram. Talk to each other. Um, we're all going through hell, you know. Some of us just get up and stage and are crazy enough to talk about it. So I love you guys. Um, we're going to do a real quick Q&A with Jay. Um, not Q&A with Jay. That's about 10 years ago that I used to do that on Revolution. Sorry, brain fart. We are going to do Afterglow, but I don't think it'll be a very long Afterglow. So if you have questions, if you're on Instagram and you have questions, send your questions now. Um, I'm going to ask our children's pastor, Caleb, if he needs to push anything. Caleb is going to go push the Afterglow button, the official Afterglow. We should turn the room blue when it's Afterglow. So do we have any Afterglow questions? I have some jumbled thoughts. You have some jumbled thoughts? Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to, you want to share some of your jumbled thoughts? Do you want to get up and hear yeah, them? Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, I like what you're saying. But. But. No, 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 no. It's not a but. Do you need uh, a, do you want to get it on the vocals here? On the mic up there? Well, no, I'm just trying to get it on oh, here. I'll stand over here. How about that? That's good. I'm going to just turn the mic. Here's Caleb's question, everybody. Hi. Uh, it's not really a question. It's just an observation. I'm, I don't want this to sound negative towards any group. Um, and I think that everything that that you said, uh, I think maybe a secondary or maybe even a tertiary point that you're making relates to this. Uh, I'm involved with like some atheist groups in the Twin Cities. What? Yeah. But any, but sometimes I, I take a long time to get to my point. But uh, um, something that I've observed that I think you're kind of alluding to is a lot of atheists who are still very angry and stuck in the paradigm of, of truth versus... Um, lies or, or, or uh, I don't know, I guess disillusionment versus illusion. And um, I think that being stuck in that paradigm and being still angry at the church or angry at God or angry at what you were fed, um, is, I think that that's something that you have to go through. Um, I'll take care of that. It's okay. I think that's something that you have to go through, uh, and I think that's a healthy step in the process. But I think that still obsessing over like, well, I, I was taught all these lies and I was, I, was, I was taught this unhealthy version of this and this and this and, and I was hurt by the church. Like, yes, you were. And being stuck on that is still feeding into that dichotomy, that paradigm and, and being stuck on, on being angry at the church and things like that. Like, like, sure, you can and you can process that, but I think that, that you, can, you can move forward from that and even uh, reclaim some terminology from that if you want to, um, or just like, just, just leave it and, and forget about it. But like being stuck on still attacking an institution that's associated with pe the people who populated it, you know, happen to have hurt you and still associated with, with this message that, that to you reminds you of the trauma that you went through. I think still being angry at that and attacking that, um, I don't think it's helping anyone. I don't think. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of saying this to, uh, the, some groups of atheists that I'm involved with who, who uh, are graceful to me because I, I'm a Christian and um, with an asterisk. But, you know, but uh, I, I don't know. I did, I'm not sure exactly. Like I said, these are jumbled thoughts. But I think 
I don't think that you have to always commit to being mad at the institution. I think that there, there are ways to um, to reapproach it and even and reclaim it, and even to step into it and say, okay, now this is Christianity. Yeah. You know, now now this is what we're doing. And if you're not on board, then fine. But but still continuing to choose to engage with attacking it and uh, oh, thank you. And being being negative and obsessing over that, I think I don't think it's helping as much as it could. Anyways, I don't know. Jumble thoughts. Uh, Thank you for yeah. your jumble thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Where'd you get this? Oh, okay. Hi. We got good on you, Caleb. Someone said true. Um, Everyone say a special prayer for those struggling with addiction during the holidays. There are those who need to feel okay with contradictions in their own thinking. Yes, there are. Um, la there's a book called Life After Hegel that talks about living in contradictions. It's a, it's a hard read, but um, I recommend it. And um, for me, going through addiction in holidays, I mean, I'm doing better now, but I used to just spend my holidays at an AA clubhouse and just hit meetings all day long. Um, but be patient with one another, especially in the holidays, because man, it's such a hard time and there's so many triggers. One other thing is that, um, I mean, it's hard to see people that are trapped in rage yeah. and anger, but we also can't decide for other people how they're going to deal with that how they're going to move beyond that. Yeah. And we can't rescue other people. And anger keeps us alive. I mean, there are, when we're in abusive situations, um, sometimes anger is what helps us remain sane. And so, you know, we can't ask other people to face their pain. That's a place they have to come to themselves because that's a more vulnerable place, and so they have to feel safe enough to do that. Yeah. I'm going to repeat that a little bit. You're going to what it? I'm going to repeat it just for a second here. Oh, okay. For the folks on, on, on Translate. Instagram. No, but Vicki was just saying that, you know, sometimes anger is good because it keeps us going, especially when we're in tough, bad, relation, hard relationships. And sometimes it gets us out of them, too, because we're angry enough. And uh, that we also can't tell people, what was it? Well, we can't, they, we can't tell them, How determine to, their timing. We can't determine other people's time period on forgiving others or- Or facing their own Or facing pain. their own pain, yeah. No, we can't. Um, I think one of my hopes is that when people watch Revolution, or listen to Revolution, is that it's just a little encouragement towards it. You know, not that, hey, you need to do this. Because we're not here to should on you, um, yeah. but we're here to encourage you to, you know, keep moving forward the best you can. Or sit in the bed and cry for a while, but then call a friend and talk to him if you got one. Or just you know send us a direct message or something, or look at Instagram. That's my issue. Um, well. Thanks everybody for a great service and a great time. Um, one more reminder is that uh, it is the end of the year and some of you like tax write-offs. Um, <laughs> if you do, Revolution is still, <laughs> we're still a nonprofit, So um, you can donate uh, by going to revolutionchurch.com and clicking on the donation button. We could yearly use your support and your help because that's how we do it. Um, I would love in 2020 to have Caleb be at least a part-time staff member. Um, but we can only do that with the support of uh, folks like you on Instagram and folks like you listening online. Um, that's how we make this thing keep going and how we do our work. And we're grateful to be able to do it and we just wanna make it better. And that's what we're trying to do is just get out to more people, make it better and uh, tighten things up a little bit. So thank you so much for your support. We love you all very much. Bye-bye, have a great day. If you enjoyed this show, you might also like Loosen the Bible Belt with Kristen Becker and myself, Jay Bain. We're living in a society that's like money buys comfort. 
and ease. Yes. And and at the core of that, it's trust, right? I mean, at, at the it's a it's a mistrust of of allowing yourself vulnerability. Yeah, and you see both sides doing it. You see the progressives want to be comfortable with their life and say, you know, all conservatives are bad. And then you see the conservatives doing it and they want their way of life. And they're both seeking comfort. And what we've been talking about doing with the Loose in the Bible about podcast and tour is saying we want to create a space where people can come and be uncomfortable and disagree well. And we've lost the art of disagreeing well because we all want to be taken care of and be affirmed. And it's like, you know, when are we going to grow up? You know, it's not about being happy and comfortable, not for the progressive and not for the conservative. Yeah. And, and in fact, right, that that tension that we cannot handle actually creates more animosity. Yes. Right. Yes. We begin to dehuman, dehumanize the other that we disagree with to the point that we can no longer. I mean, shit, we can't we can't even sit next to each other and worship the deity together. That's pathetic. Bounty, superstition, prayer. Spirituality. That was a post-Christian podcast. <laughs>